evidence of your discipleship by people that are hearing about Jesus Christ through your mouth. Jesus Christ told us himself in the word, be a disciple and go out and make disciples. And that's what we do. That's what we do. So as you continue to grow in Christ, whether it's through social media, whether it's through podcasts, whether it's through the workplace, whether it's through family gatherings and get-togethers, whatever it may be, whatever the outlet may be, somebody should be hearing about Christ through you. And not always necessarily through your words, but through your fruits, through your actions, through your mannerisms, through your integrity, through the behavior in the midst of the foolishness that the world has to offer. People should know Jesus Christ is alive and well through his disciples, and we are his disciples. Amen. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 3. Imagine experiencing blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Ephesians chapter 3 offers a glimpse into such blessings, revealing the depths of God's love and power available to you in Christ Jesus. This chapter shifts from establishing our identity in Christ to exploring practical implications, how we access and experience the riches, the riches God bestows upon us. This chapter, the Apostle Paul, he's making it clear that the old covenant has shifted and become a new covenant. And you might say, well, what was the old covenant? Well, the old covenant that God had was with the Israelites. God chose a certain people to label them his people. And in the entire Old Testament, if you study the prophets and if you study the, 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 the book of, of you know, Deuteronomy and, and when Moses existed and, and you study from Genesis all the way up until Matthew, you're going to see that it was always addressing the Israelites. It was always addressing God's chosen people. So if you read only the Old Testament, you're going to think that, well, we don't even count. And this doesn't include me and this wasn't written for me because the Old Testament was the old covenant that was God choosing a certain people and then Jesus Christ came and he died as a perfect sacrifice to break the old covenant and create a new covenant allowing all Gentiles to have access to salvation just like the Israelites. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, For this reason, actually, Brother Juan, read verse 1 for me. Uh, for this I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Stop right there. So, so mine says it a little different. We have different versions, and that's great. Um, it's important to get a Bible that you understand, a Bible that's easy and simplify things for you to know what's being said and what's being talked about. I advise you that when you study the Word of God, that you not only read the Bible that you have, but you go onto the Bible app and go to different versions and see how different versions words it because it gives you a greater understanding based on how the version breaks it down. So it's a good tool to use to know, well, let me see how it says it in five different Bibles and I'll get a better understanding of exactly what's being said, how to understand it and how to apply it to my life. Amen? Amen. Mine says, for this reason, because I 
preached that you and believing Jews are joint heirs, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. A lot of times, life happens to us in different ways. And when life happens to us, it makes us feel some type of way. And sometimes we get to the point of feeling like this happened to me because of this person. And this happened to me because of that person. And, and they're to blame for this situation. And the Apostle Paul could have easily said, this is happening to me because of the Romans who are unbelievers, because of the Romans who are blasphemers, because of the Romans who don't accept Christ and know that Jesus is the Christ. This is happening to me and I'm very upset about it because instead of being out in the world preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, I'm now in chains. I'm now in shackles and I can't do my job as a man of integrity and a believer of Jesus Christ. He could have easily took that approach. But I want you to hear verse 1. I want you to hear his mentality. He says, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus. He was a prisoner of the Romans. But he's saying, nothing else matters to me except Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing else matters in this world except Holy Bible. Nothing else matters to me except the, the experience that I had with an almighty God that has changed my life. So if I am a prisoner, I am not a prisoner of the Romans. I am a prisoner to the cross of Calvary. I am a prisoner to what Jesus Christ did for me. I am a prisoner to the Holy Bible. I am a prisoner to the truth. I am a prisoner to the only God, the one true God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You gotta have a mentality and know who you are and whose you are at all times. Mm. That's just verse one. Mm. Praise God. That's just verse one. Are you a believer when the storms of life come your way? Are you a believer when times get really rough? Most people, that's when they do their most praying. When times get really rough, that's when they remember God because they need help. It's not going to always be rainy days in your life. There's going to be seasons that everything is smooth sailing. Don't forget who God is when everything is going good. Don't forget who died on Calvary's cross and why he died on Calvary's cross when everything is smooth sailing. Should you come to Christ when situations arise like Paul being imprisoned? Absolutely. You should talk to God. And if you have a deep relationship with God, you should take advantage of that situation and make sure that if there's other people that are incarcerated with you, they're hearing about God. There are guards that are watching you, they're hearing about God. No matter where I am, no matter what I do, because I am a Christian, somebody got to hear about Jesus Christ. Amen. That needs to be the mentality. That needs to be the approach. The Apostle Paul. Listen, this man, you're going to hear him insult himself. He insults himself periodically in the books that he writes. You're going to hear it. He calls himself a wretched man. He calls himself chief sinner. He says negative things about himself. And you might ask, like, why is one of the greatest believers ever to walk the face of the earth constantly putting himself down? Here's the thing. I would imagine, right, because I can't talk to Paul until I get to heaven. But I would imagine that the Apostle Paul, who had integrity as a Pharisee, he thought that Jesus Christ was a blasphemer. And he thought that everybody that believed in Jesus Christ was a blasphemer. So 
him as a Pharisee among Pharisees. He persecuted the church. He persecuted the church to the point of murdering Christians because they were blasphemers. I would imagine that when he was on the road to Damascus and he experienced Jesus Christ for himself and God himself says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I would imagine that when he came to the realization that his integrity was a lie, it broke him on the inside. Broke him so much that he can't get away from the brokenness throughout his entire Christ walk. He's always calling himself a chief sinner. He's always calling himself a wretched man. He's always putting labels on himself because he realizes, oh my God, I killed people that believed in the truth. I terrorized people that believed in the truth. Did he understand God's forgiveness? Did he understand God's grace? Of course he did. Nobody wrote more about grace than the Apostle Paul. His books are the grace message. But when you fall in love with Jesus because of a personal encounter that you have with Jesus, you feel all the dirt that you've done in your life. And because you feel all the dirt that you've done in your life, it's not that you're operating in self-condemnation. It's almost like you become indebted to God. I owe God. I say it all the time. I owe God my life. I gave years of my life to the world. I gave years of my life to sin. I gave years of my life to all those minions that the devil has sent my way. I gave years. And for what? And for what? Now I serve God. And yeah, I can relate to a lot of people because I understand a lot of people's mentalities because of the dirt that they do now and the dirt that I did in the past. And it's great and it serves as good testimony and it serves for good understanding and it serves for good counseling. But knowing who God is and knowing what the Calvary cross really did and knowing the love of God, I wish, oh, I wish I would have served God my entire life because he's so good. Hallelujah. Verse 2, Brother 1. says, if indeed you have heard of the dissipation of the grace of God which was given to me for you. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me to share with you. For your benefit. Verse 3, I'm going to keep on. And that by divine revelation, the mystery was made known to me as I have already written in brief. The mystery that he's talking about here is the mystery of the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant being for the Israelites only. The new covenant including the Gentiles. And as we read on, you'll see that this is exactly what he's talking about when he refers to the mystery. It says, by referring to this, when you read it, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not disclosed to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Six, it says, it is this, that the Gentiles are now joint heirs with the Jews and members of the same body and joint partakers sharing in the same divine promise in Christ Jesus through their faith in the good news of salvation. The mystery is that Jesus Christ came down, from the heaven, came down from the heavenlies, died on that cross, resurrected, but he didn't do it just for the Jews. 
the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Israelites, the Israelites, the Jews, the Israelites, the Israelites, the Jews. You, you didn't hear anything about the Gentiles. And a lot of Gentiles were destroyed in wars and, and killed and went, to, went through all types of things in their life because God had a chosen people that had to go through different lands to get to the promised land. So it was always all about the Israelites and God's grace and favor and love for the Israelites. Jesus Christ and the Father from the beginning wanted the Gentiles to not feel left out. They said, but the only way to do this, the only way to do this is to create a master plan and a strategy that literally covers all sin so that whether Jew or Gentile it's irrelevant because now the plan is for sin to be defeated it's for sin to be forgiven so if it's about the sin being forgiven so that people may have an opportunity at eternal life the Israelites sin they proved that throughout the Old Testament all day long all day long they seen miracles they seen all types of movements and manifestations of God's power and love. And they would still complain and complain and complain some more. So God brought forth a plan that literally put everybody, and the Bible labels it a mystery. Why did the mystery come forth after Jesus? Why didn't it exist? We don't know the mind of God. Why didn't it exist in the Old Testament? Because God felt like leaving it for the New Testament. There's some things that are not going to be able to be explained because God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's mind is infinite. God's mind is eternal. Our minds are carnal. Our minds are finite. Our minds will never understand completely the complexities of God's thoughts but that's why this is a faith walk Amen. it's not for you to understand it's for you to embrace in faith the Bible teaches us right so so there's a bunch of angels in heaven right and I would imagine that these angels it's easy for them to spend all day long worshiping God why? Because they see him in his glory. They see him in all power. They see him in all wisdom. To be in his presence all day long, there is nothing that's going to change their mind about who God is. He's real. He's alive. He's well. He's in their face. But blessed are you who don't see God and believe. Amen. Blessed are you who says, there was a word written that's timeless. It was written many, many years ago, and it still touches me today. That had to be God. Blessed are you for not having to see to believe. Jesus Christ said it to Thomas. Thomas was like, I would believe if I can touch where they stuck the nails through your hands and where they stuck the nails through your feet. If I can put my finger in the hole, I would believe that you are Jesus. She said, okay, I'm going to let you touch and I'm going to let you see, Thomas. But blessed are those who don't need to see to believe. Amen. Blessed are those who don't need to see to believe. What is blessed means to your pastor? On his way to heaven is the man that don't need to see to believe. They believe because they read. They believe because they know the book is alive. They believe because they feel the spirit of God come upon them and they feel the manifestation of the Holy Ghost depending on the words that they're hearing or the praises that they're giving God. Amen. Blessed are they on their way to heaven are they. Amen? Amen. It says, 
in verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Listen to that. That's crazy. The Apostle Paul, who wrote 75% of the New Testament, it's saying, I am the very least of all the saints. That's, that's a humble mentality. That's a man that acknowledges that he is nothing without God. That's a man that acknowledges that life is not about me. It's all about Jesus. That's a man that acknowledges that we are so minute to a great big God. He's calling himself the least of all the saints. And most that would read the Bible will say, well, he was one of the greatest of all the saints. But yet his mentality is, I owe God my life. I owe God everything. I am going to live and talk like I know that what he did, he did for me. And that what I did was dirty and against him. And now I need to make up by living for him with everything that I do. Praise God. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, God's people, this grace, which is undeserved, was graciously given to proclaim to the Gentiles, that's you and I, the good news of the incomprehensible riches of Christ, that spiritual wealth which no one can fully understand. Verse 9, and to make plain to everyone the plan of the mystery regarding the uniting of believers, of believing Jews and Gentiles into one body which until now was kept hidden through the ages in the mind of God who created all things. Verse 10. So now, through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects might now be made known, revealing the mystery to the angelic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I'm sorry, what what version are you reading? So so <laughs> this is deep. <laughs> this is this is a lot. So th this this version is the amplified version. I love the amplified version. It breaks it down in a different way that you cannot not understand. It. That's a lot, that's dope. It's 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 really good. Um I, I recommend, you know, what version of the Bible do you have, uh Sister Maria? I know. She has the NLT, which is a great version. It breaks it down to the simplest form. The amplified version gives you so much of the same thing that it puts you in a position to have to understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely recommend the, the amplified version. I definitely recommend the NLT. Um, find a version that works for you. I'm, I'm, I'm falling deeper and deeper in love with the amplified. Um, I'm a King James guy when I set up my sermons. But when I study to set up my sermons, I'm now studying in the Amplified because it gives you so much steak and potatoes to play with. Mm. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so, so, verse 10 says, So now through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects might now be made known the revealing of the mystery to the angelic rulers of authorities in the heavenly places. Listen, the, 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 the angelic in heavenly places, they're there with God. But nowhere in the Bible does it register that, that angels were made and created in the image of God. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we have been created in the image of God. And, and you know, it's saying here, in countless aspects might now be made known revealing the mystery to the angelic rulers of the authorities in heavenly places they're experiencing revelation through what has been given us they're experiencing well we're here with God and we see him we have no choice but to believe but these creatures, they're different. They're wired different. They don't live with God. They don't spend time in his presence the way we do. And yet they praise him. And yet they serve him. And yet they change for him. 
And yet they have the power of yes and the power of no. And they have free will and choose to serve him anyway. The mysteries are being revealed to them as they watch from the heavenlies. Like, wow, this is something special to see a group of believers that genuinely change everything about themselves for someone they have not seen. Hallelujah. It's amazing. That's dope. Verse 11. This is in accordance with the terms of the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. 12. In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him that is our faith gives us sufficient courage to freely and openly approach God through Christ Jesus. I got to stop right there for a minute. Hear me and hear me well, please. I don't mind any one of you coming to me with questions, with biblical questions, with life questions, with needing prayer, with whatever it is that you need to come to me as your pastor. I don't mind. That's what I'm here for, right? But I need you to understand this verse. I need you to get this verse in your spirit because this verse matters. You have access to God. I repeat, you have access to God. You can get in the presence of God and put yourself in a position where God begins to reveal things to you. You can get in the presence of God and put yourself in a position where God begins to manifest his glory in your life personally. You can get in the presence of God and put yourself in a position where now God desires to be intimate with you. You don't need a pastor for that. You got prayer and you got the word. Stay in the presence of God through prayer and the word. And I promise you, I promise you that God would get so, he will get so involved in the details of your life that you will never ask a human being another question again. Because you're going to realize, yeah, Pastor Jason's a nice guy. Pastor Jason, you know, he's an aggressive teacher and he teaches me well. He puts it in simple terms for me to understand it. And, and he does things with his heart and he loves us to life and that's great. But God spoke to me. But God revealed something to me. But God showed me a golden nugget. But God manifested the scripture in my own very eyes to the point where I don't want to go to Pastor Jason. I want God. You have access, church. You have access, church. Hallelujah. Get that in your spirit. You have access to God. To God, right there in your home, right there in your room, whether you be in a prison cell, whether you be on the street, no matter where you find yourself, you have access to God. Because as I always say, it doesn't matter how many steps you've taken backwards in life. There's only one step to Jesus Christ, and it's called repentance. Praise God. I love me some Jesus. I love me some Jesus. How many people love them some Jesus in the house? Come on. Come on. He's so good. He's so good. Like, if, if you really get into the word and you really start studying, like, what God truly did. Thank you, Lord. And, and, and how, how in, in our best efforts... We're like filthy rags. We don't deserve God. We don't deserve eternal life. Our best efforts, we still fall short. We still fall short. Why? Because this flesh is so sinful. And it takes constantly checking yourself and checking the flesh and constantly applying Bible scriptures which are holy into your life to get this walk right. Because naturally, we desire sin. Naturally, we desire flesh. Naturally, we desire the world. Naturally. I don't get mad at you guys when you fall short. 
Matter of fact, I, I, as a pastor, I love you to life over and over and over. And for some of you, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Because that's the grace of God. That's how good his love is. And, and he's never, he's never going to get tired of loving you. He's going to get hurt when you reject him. But he's never going to get tired of loving you. And after all your rejections, if you decide to make it right, you know what he does? He opens his arms. And he embraces you when you come as the prodigal son. He loves you no matter what. You have access to him. Praise God. 13 says, so I ask you not to lose heart at my sufferings on your behalf. For they are your glory and honor. Don't, don't lose heart when somebody that is a teacher or a preacher and that you love dearly because they teach and preach the gospel, when they go through things, don't lose heart. Don't let it bother you to the point where you're angry and you want to fight somebody who does something to your pastor. Don't, don't, get to the, don't get to that point. Know that it has to happen. It has to happen. Why? Because in my trials and tribulations, God is molding something new in me. God is teaching me something brand new that he's going to reveal to me at a later date for me to bring forth the gospel in a stronger way, in a more powerful way, in a more impactful way that puts you in a position to become greater. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I love Tuesdays. Should I take him away from Janika forever? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I was only kidding. I was only kidding. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. God forgive me for, you know, being Tony Montana on your pulpit for a quick second there. I'm sorry. That was out of order. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> oh, man. 14 says... For this reason, grasping the greatness of this plan by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, listen, some of us have, I, I want everybody praying. And there's never a wrong time to pray and there's never a wrong pl place to pray. You can pray anywhere, anytime. That's, 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 that's great, right? But there's something. There's something about a father seeing a respect and a reverence from his children. The Apostle Paul says, I bow down on my knees. Because he's acknowledging God. This man was a great Christian. This man saved many this man went through all types of hills and valleys for the glory of God. This man operated in signs and wonders and healing. This man did some great works for God. And in all that greatness, that man regularly bowed down in the presence of an almighty God. If that man give God reverence based on his testimonial life, we need to follow suit. We need to make time to give God reverence at home. At home. My family came to my house the other day. It was Erica's second time since I moved in there and my mom's first time and I showed them. I didn't let them go in, but I let them peek into my closet, my secret closet. I have a room that's dedicated to God and, and it matters. It matters. If you don't have the luxury of having an extra space, then listen, in your room, in your bedroom, make a corner that nobody can touch that belongs to Jesus. Amen. That belongs to Jesus. That, that he knows that every time you step foot in that corner, it's time to talk to daddy and he's listening. Mm -hmm. Put God in a position where he knows, yeah, yeah, my son's about to give me some reverence. <laughs> My daughter's about to get in my presence and talk to me about her personal business. My daughter needs me. My son desperately wants something and needs something from me. I need to pay attention to what he's about to say. 
make a special place that belongs just to you and the Father. It's worth it. It's worth it. It'll change your life. Listen, it's funny. I, I, I have my alarm clock. Holy Spirit got a sense of humor too. I have my alarm clock at four o'clock in the morning, right? Holy Spirit's been waking me up at 3.59. <laughs> 3.59, and, and I've been waking up looking at the clock like, should I close my eyes for one more minute? No, no, no. We just get up, shut off my alarm and run into that closet. But it's, it's, it's hilarious how when you create a reverence for God in routine that, you know what, this is your time, this belongs to you, Holy Spirit will make sure that you don't even fail at that. Amen. He'll make sure. He'll get involved and say, wake up, it's time. Amen. It's time. Get in the presence. He wants to tell you something. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Give God what we have been given by him. Time. He gave you time. Time to do certain things. Times to choose a certain career. Time to have relationships. Time to have friendships. Time to become. Time to get it right because you took so long in the mess of life. He gave you time. Give God your time time in return, in appreciation, in gratefulness for what he has given you. Amen. 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 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, God, the first ultimate father. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, indwelling your innermost being and personality, 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you, having been deeply rooted and secretly grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, God's people, the width, the length, the height, and the depth of his love. Fully experiencing that amazing, endless love. Listen, if you get in that closet every single day, no matter how you feel, you're going to start experiencing the width, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. And it's going to change the course of your life forever. Nothing will move you from your Christianity. No matter how big the storm, no matter how big the trial, no matter how big the tribulation, nothing will move you from the love of God when you experience it on this level. It says, 19, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives. Ooh, that moves me. So that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. Oh my God. Oh, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want to be flooded with God's presence in my life. Listen, Peter was so flooded with God's presence in his life, that his shadow was healing the sick. He didn't even have to talk or touch people. His shadow, he was so full of God that his shadow healed the sick. Let me tell you something. I need you to get this in your spirit. You have an advantage over Peter. Peter is dead. You are alive. Peter had his time to serve God. Now is your time. Mm. Listen. 20. Listen, 20 is one of my favorite verses. I love this verse. I need you, if you don't get nothing else, get this verse in your spirit. Ephesians 3.20. 
It says, now unto him. Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose. I want, I want a different version. Um, Juan, read it in yours. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Stop right there. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly. exceedingly. Next word. Abundantly. Abundantly. Next word. Above all. Above all. That we ask. That we ask. Or think. Or think. According. According. To the power. To the power. That works in us. That worketh in you. Amen. Listen. Listen. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I, I, I just. I, I, I feel One like, more time. Listen. There you go. I feel, I feel, I, listen. Listen. I need you to get this in your spirit. I need you to get this in the spirit. God is going to do greater, far greater than you can imagine, than you can think, than you can ask, than you can desire, right? But here's the thing. He's not going to do it for you. He's going to do it through you. Oh, man. If you spend your life in the presence of God, he is going to use you. You are going to be an instrument of God. He's going to do some amazing works through your life. People are going to experience the almighty God through you. Man. That's big. That's big to know that. Yo, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be used by God. We don't deserve it. Like, we've made so many poor choices. We've hurt people. We've broken people. We've sinned and sinned and sinned some more. We don't deserve anything from God. And he's saying, no matter what you've done, I love you anyway. My love is so great for you that I not only want to share my love with you, I want to share my miraculous power with you. And I don't want to do it for you. I want to raise you up so people not only put respect on my name, but that people may put some respect on your Oh, live your life in a manner that people put some respect on your name because they see the God that works in your life. Amen. Verse 20, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Listen, God is worthy. He's worthy to be served. He's worthy for you to be obedient to his word. He's worthy for you to sacrifice whatever you need to sacrifice and live a life that's pleasing and acceptable in his sight. He's worthy. I challenge you to surrender. I challenge you to surrender. Don't let this be just another year. Make sure that you're journaling so you can see where you are right now. And what God does to you in a 12-month span. And you can look back and say, wow, God's power, God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's miraculous healing power has transformed my life. Oh, listen, that was chapter 3, amen? That was chapter 3. I, um, I got more notes on chapter 3, but it's 7.58. I'm always mindful and respectful of people's time. Um, but I love this. We can do this forever, in my opinion. I love the word. I love Bible study. I love preaching and teaching it. I am so not worthy, but I thank God for the privilege. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That's tonight's Bible study. Church.